folks, can you see my uh, my presentation? Yep. Just awesome. Cool. So glad that you made it today and took time out of your busy calendar to, to show up today. So we're talking about better decision making, but what does that actually mean? Decision making is the process of making choices by identifying a decision, gathering information, and assessing alternate solutions. So start thinking of recent decisions in your team or group or workplace, both ones that went well and ones that didn't go quite so well. Or maybe you need to make a decision and you haven't decided yet, and that's part of why you're here today. So how, why ever, you know, why ever you're here today is so glad that you showed up today. Um, I'd like folks to engage. So just raise and lower your hand in Zoom. Let's get everybody practicing with engaging. I find that if people engage up front, they're more likely to engage throughout, and we definitely want to keep you engaged um, throughout. So please feel free to start raising your hand or using some of those 900 emojis that they uh, made available on Zoom recently. And we will definitely leverage the chat. So if you feel like saying something uh, or a comment on something, do leverage the chat, not only for questions, but to chat throughout with other attendees. Why am I talking about better decision-making and how did I get here where I am at today? So I've been through nine agile transitions from the inside as a full-time employee or full-time contractor. I've also did consulting work. Uh, I'm now at Citrix as director of LACE. We're not entirely a safe shop, uh, despite my title, but we do find LACE a useful frame for sharing agile practices and principles. Throughout the years, I've discovered that most people are unhappy and not engaged in their work. So I actually want to alleviate misery in the workplace. People are miserable because the processes and practices and ways of working don't really match the way they want to work today, modern work, knowledge work. So I want to change that. Um, I'm also a co-founder and advisory board member of the Open Leadership Network. And you'll hear more about a couple of ideas from Open Leadership Network as we go through this, uh, as through this session. So how I just ponder to yourself, you can feel free to post it in the chat if you want to, but just mostly for yourself, how clear is the decision-making process in your workplace? Do you even uh, know who decided on the path forward and what options were on the table? Why did this one win over another one? Has anything changed since then? Um, so think to yourself and we'll revisit this at the end. And, I, and what I'm hoping is if you're answering a lower on the scale by the end of this talk, you feel like you could get to a higher number by leveraging some of these things that we're talking about today. A good decision is based on knowledge and not numbers. So Plato was you know, more than a thousand years ago. He was onto something though, but what couldn't he have imagined that all the data that we had today at our fingertips, but he actually was onto something. What did he mean by knowledge? I feel like he meant knowledge comes from a lot of things. It's not easily dissected when you're making a decision, right? It's, it's way more than just the numbers, the data, uh, but it's this explicit and implicit tacit information based on our experience. And now more than ever, we need to leverage everyone's tacit and explicit knowledge. So if you look at this chart, so many things can go into our concept of expertise and knowledge. So I won't dwell too much on this slide. Just think about all the things that you consider when you're making a decision, maybe things that you don't even know that you are considering, right? Aside from that, we've got the, the actual data that we have, this contextual multidimensional understanding, the system in which you try to make the decision as well. So I've, now I've got data, but what about the incentives and pressures that people are under? As an example, I know of a situation where the product of VP is paid out on how many new features are released, but the engineering VP in the same line of business is paid on his bonus on uptime. They actually talked about it and realized they have misaligned incentives. So they were open enough to talk about it. Think about the incentives maybe that we don't know about that are hidden under the surface. So including levels of trust, if it's a low trust environment, it's entirely possible that the data to make the decisions you need, it has likely not been able to surface at all. The knowledge is impacted by the different ways people make sense of things, like they're, the way they think about the world. Uh, some people like check boxes and checklists and are very organized. Other people try to you know, pull things together just randomly and somehow it all comes together at the end. They're analytics. Some people want to ruminate and think about it. Uh, I had a team that they didn't even want to answer a, a check-in question without having the question in advance. So you see, there's a lot of differences here, and that's um, that's part of with the brilliance of what makes us human and how and why we also fall into some decision-making traps. So let's go to some of the decision-making traps. So this session is absolutely focused more on teams than individuals, 
but a lot of these things that we talk about will absolutely be just as relevant for you as an individual. So anchoring. The mind gives disproportionate weight to the first information it receives, kind of like a spotlight, looking for information. The first time it gets something, it latches onto it and it cannot, cannot move past it. So if I asked you whether the population of Nigeria is over 35 million, and then I asked you what the population of Nigeria is, you're more likely to put a lower number than if I asked you if the population of Nigeria is more than 200 million. It's in fact 214 million. So another aspect of anchoring is over-focusing on past trends. So I guess the stock market might be the easy example of trend that folks can relate to, right? But the past doesn't necessarily predict the future, especially nowadays. So leverage the data you have with care. And overconfidence bias. That's a bias towards believing that one can predict the future and forget potential pitfalls. So we, we tend to forget all the challenges we experienced in a particular uh, experience. Sound familiar? Like project management often deals with overconfidence and schedules. We forget all the things that we had to go through getting to that end goal and all the late nights that we had to put in. There is um, sunk cost. This is probably one we're most familiar with. It's basing decisions on past behaviors and a desire not to lose invested time or money. So I heard this just recently when someone said, but we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars implementing SAFE. It seems like a waste to abandon it. I mean, obviously that's, that's wrong for so many reasons, right? Not only should we not keep doing what doesn't serve us if they felt it didn't serve them, but in that case, we should also measure what we learned from it along the way, what remaining elements might stick out, of, uh, stick around of what worked and so on. A few years ago, I was working at a place where they were rewriting entire software feature set on an on-prem software solution. They had multiple teams working multiple years on it, and they kept going despite warning signs that it was not well architected. The staff turnover led to a solution being implemented that didn't solve the original reason for the rewrite, but the people who remembered were not the decision makers. So under intense pressure from management and investors, the new version was released, and actually they had to pull it back. That is another example of a sunk cost. So status quo um, might be a bias towards options that are similar to the current situation. Can we really think outside the box? So this is kind of sticky too. So it's under, when we're under time pressure or rush to decide, similar options might appear to make sense to us. So consider whether this is guaranteed to succeed just because it worked in a past scenario. Then there is the next one, uh, sorry, confirmation bias. That's using only information that supports our existing or point of view while avoiding information that contradicts it. So how can you police yourself? Here's a personal example from my past. I worked at a startup and they, had, they were really trying to listen to customers. They had a bunch of friendly customers. Well, the, the, the problem was they only listened to the positive things that those friendly customers were saying. They didn't consider people who didn't want to opt in because they didn't want to use the product. So they were really trying to engage customers, but they didn't want to listen to the ones with negative feedback. So, you know, long story short, they, the product never actually made it to the marketplace. Uh, framing, framing is a trap because how you frame a problem or solution impacts how we react to it. For example, we're risk averse. So framing something as a loss versus a gain would make you pick the less risky option. Other framing examples can lead to status quo, confirmation bias and narrow framing, limiting your choices. So Telltale signs of some of this framing might be, you know, either this or that uh, conditions, watch whether it's framed as a loss or a gain. So to avoid narrow framing, there's an example uh, for, of allowing people to work on different features, sorry, the same feature with different solutions, for example, to see which one wins. Um, and that's just one example. So the next one is making decisions based on limited evidence or data. So this is, this is really sticky as well, right? So we, we think we're being diligent, but, and we have some information in front of us, but it's the information we don't have that you cannot even consider. That's a little different than narrow framing or anchoring. An example might be in a zone of conflict or war where you have intelligence that tells you something and you try to make a decision using that data, but in situations like it's what you don't know. Another example that I was thinking about this morning is, if you send a survey asking for feedback and only the people who are interested in, let's say a conference want it, will respond to that. The other people who aren't really interested in having and attending the conference probably won't answer. So then you're like, oh my gosh, everybody of the hundred people I sent it, they all want the conference. So this is a really great decision. Uh, but if it's only 30 people, the 70 people who may not have wanted that conference didn't actually choose to respond. So 
Uh, those are those are some things. So I'm going to ask you to think about these in just a moment. So when we go to the next slide, get ready for a two minute activity where I'm going to ask you to um, brainstorm for two minutes. I'll, I'll run a little timer. Let's see if this timer works on my machine. I'm going to ask for some volunteers to just type in the chat or unmute what you thought during these two minutes. So basically reflect on a recent decision at your workplace. Was it a good decision? How do you know? Do you think you fell into any decision making traps at your uh, at your workplace as a result? So everybody ready? I'm gonna start the two minute timer. Give a thumbs up. Let's see if this works. seconds left. Cool. Thanks for participating. And sorry if the music was not to your taste. Um, but did you reflect on a decision? Did anyone did something come up for anyone about a bias that you may have fallen into in your workplace? limited evidence or data bias. Great, thank you. One of the thing I'm thinking about specifically is that conference one that we were, we were running a survey and it's like, yes, everybody wants the conference. Cool, anyone else wanna add something to the chat? Do you think this could help you in your personal life too? Okay, moving right along. There's a lot of guidance about decision-making. So two of the items that come up in almost all of the guidance about decision-making are two things. Include different perspectives and be clear about boundaries and objectives. Well, everybody says that, of course. Well, obviously I wanna include different perspectives. That seems obvious. But when people get busy and focus on resource utilization, this readily falls by the wayside. One other thing that I have noticed is that new leaders often come into organizations wanting to make an impact right away. So they make huge decisions when they have the least information to do so and they may not have been told the truth about what's actually going on. Um, they wanna be seen as knowledgeable and decisive. And so there's a bias towards action in this case that the leadership team usually has, and they're rushing to make decisions to move fast. So they don't ask questions of folks on the ground floor. And that's one anti-pattern I've noticed. What stands out for me is like, really it's a false sense of, of speed when you don't include people because they're not bought in usually and they're they don't, not agreeing with your decision because you haven't, you don't know all the answers and they, they know that you haven't, uh, you haven't really got the full picture here. Objectives and boundaries are often not made clear. Everyone thinks they're obvious, but really they're not. 
So the goal today is to share two open leadership patterns that address these needs, given as guidance to help us make better decisions. And we found that when we incorporate these patterns into our decision-making approach, we have much better results. So, and again, while this is focused on team decision-making, I hope that you'll find it useful for any individual decisions. So we're gonna introduce some ideas for you to be able to move fast and make better decisions. So the two patterns today that can help you understand how to make better decisions are boundary management and whole group process. There are eight patterns on this wheel. If there's time at the end, I'll review the other six and we're gonna talk about two today where you see the arrows. But before, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. How did this open patterns come about and why am I co-founder of the Open Leadership Network? In early 2019, Daniel Mezik approached me about creating the Open Leadership Network and I saw some of the initial work and thinking and I stopped the book I was writing for team level agile coaches because I thought the book needed to be rewritten around these patterns. So I told him I thought that patterns would turn out to be super important and I wanted to align the book with the patterns. And soon after I partnered with another coach, Kristen Hernandez on a workshop, a workshop to make small bets about this book to make a long story short, the book is still not written. We do plan to write one. And um, so it's what's funny about these icons is still they're ones, there are the ones that I picked for the very first presentation that anyone ever did on the open patterns in May of 2019. So um, why did I stop the book? The open leadership pattern struck me as easy to understand and consume and useful to everyone. In fact, I've introduced these patterns into HR departments and senior leadership teams to agile teams. So it's focused equally on the business and the team. And it was just felt like a really pragmatic way to, uh, to talk to folks about, about things and way of changing the way of working without specifically using the word agile, which a lot of people have feelings about, as you could imagine. So um, why did I think that the, these patterns themselves were so, uh, were so impactful? And what it is about patterns? Why was I passionate about patterns themselves? Patterns are everywhere. In fact, I was just speaking with someone about patterns this morning. Uh, we're familiar with the Agile Manifesto principles, but I find that folks have a hard time connecting with the principles because they seem vague, especially folks new to Agile, and they have trouble understanding how to implement those. What will it mean for them? What will they be doing differently? That's not to detract from them, but I find a huge gap between the understanding of the principles and the things that people actually do. Where patterns are everywhere, we just don't call them that because they've never been pointed out to us. It turns out that humans are great at detecting patterns. Sometimes, even when they don't really exist, it's part of our survival instinct and every everyday thought process. Right? So, if you look, just an example of finding a pattern where one may not exist. If you look at some rocks or a cloud and see a face or an animal, for example, this is an example of your brain finding a pattern. So, where can we leverage these for good? Scrum itself actually has patterns. As an example, one is called yesterday's weather. It's saying, you know, use this, this previous sprint's velocity as the best indicator of the next sprint's velocity because people tend to set increasingly high goals for themselves to the point of not being able to achieve them. Perhaps that's part of the overconfidence bias there. If you know of any other places where we use patterns a lot, feel free to post it in the chat. Well, a few things I know of, like there are design patterns in Java, right? There are patterns in chess. Not sure why patterns haven't take off, taken off as much as principles, but once you know a pattern, people expect it and will ask questions if it's missing. So you can identify anti-patterns. So let's say that senior leadership team has a propensity to work collaboratively and, and float proposals by others. Like in my current place, we, we do that. And let's say a new leader comes in and just kind of does something all on their own. They're like, wait a minute, something's wrong here. This, this is not the way we do things around here, right? So you can see that you would expect something differently. Even meetings fall into certain patterns and, uh, and relationship falling into certain patterns. So where do patterns fall into the mix between principles, et, et cetera? So there are principles, rules which govern our behavior, and a pattern is a, an example to copy or guide. If you think of a knitting pattern or sewing pattern, you're doing it yourself, but you have a model to follow. Patterns are, to me, one level deeper than principles, where you can understand enough to build more easily on them. And of course, one level higher than practices, you know, which is like a prescription, a how we're going to do this. So to put it into, uh, uh, into something for your daily work, the three questions in the daily scrum is not a pattern, that's a practice. But the daily scrum contains some open patterns like whole group process, the whole team is attending, boundary management, et cetera. It has uh, very specific time boundaries. So there are actually lots of defined patterns in Scrum, and you can find out more about the Scrum patterns at 
scrumplop.org if you are interested. So if we're thinking about the yesterday's weather pattern, it, the principle above that might be agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. So now hopefully you can see this link. Patterns aren't often talked about at all, right? But they're actually very useful as a bridge between principles and practices, in my opinion. So we're talking about intentional patterns in this session, but in real life, like I said, some patterns come up in a, unintentionally without even thinking about it. That's what norms are about and why we want to set team norms intentionally. So whether you have your team norms conversation and, uh, and document or not, team norms are set. So that's why it's better to set them intentional. Example of unintended norms might be in a meeting that used to be collaborative, but now has fallen into a status reporting pattern, right? You're just expecting this meeting to be that way. So um, take a quick moment to reflect on what patterns you might be following, perhaps not as intentionally in your workplace. So, and, and type it in, we're gonna use the, leverage the chat again. So if the decision-making patterns are mostly A, limiting people involved, maybe making decisions rapidly, before uh, trying to understand whether they're the right ones or communicating clearly, then you would put A. If it's B, escalate up the chain of command, maybe nothing is clear, so, uh, and, or no one is empowered to make decisions, so they type B in the chat. Or C, maybe we just try to get consensus on everything because we're trying to be collaborative. Um, or D, we delay hard decisions, kick the can down the road. Okay, let's see, thanks. Anyone else? Is there another pattern that you have observed that's um, that's not here that you that you find in your organization? Thanks for uh, thanks for using the chat. Cool. Okay, so we're going to take you to the open leadership patterns. The first pattern is boundary management. When we talk about the two behaviors that combat decision making uh, traps, the first one is to be clear about objective and boundaries a pattern where we explicitly communicate the boundaries of our ownership, the tasks we are in charge of, the decisions we can make, and the time constraints. We want them to be not so tight that they prevent self-organization and autonomy. A great way to think of boundary management is the rules of the game. Imagine any sports match or game you've watched. The boundaries are understood by both the players and the spectators. If you think about any sports field, right, those boundaries are very clearly marked. Their clarity of roles, the rules, and the goals creates the space for the game to be played. And that applies in business too. The game will look different each time, but the rules are clear for everyone. And it's actually much more fun as a spectator when you know the rules. And of course you couldn't play a game if it wasn't a rule as a player. And when you're playing the game well without rules, uh, right? It's not really a game, it's just a free for all. And that reminds me of some other places I've worked. Um, so there, there is a referee making the final call in a lot of cases. So we do absolutely have very clear boundaries. So I really like this frame of, thinking about decision boundaries, constraints as games. Um, and if the rules change or even seem to change, that causes our brains to go into fight or flight mode and we don't wanna collaborate with others. So I'll say, let's use intentional boundary management to get better outcomes in business. The decision boundaries are off, like we said, they're often left unclear. There are a lot of questions in this list, so I'm not going to read every question. And not every minor decision is going to have all these spelled out or need to have these spelled out. But having these questions available to you, hopefully, will make it really easy to answer them if you need to. A few of my favorite questions in the list are often forgotten. One, what's the why? What will happen if we do not make a decision? One of the uh, one example I'm thinking about right now in my current workplace is we're trying to establish guidelines and guardrails for agile ways of working, not just say, well, we're going to adhere to safe practices only. And because people are perceiving that as a very rigid boundary and they're unable to, you know, to think past that. So obviously we're, we're trying to enable agile principles. So in, in this case, it's we need to communicate very clearly what our direction of agile ways of working is. What will happen if we do not make a decision? Well, people will continue to think that we're rigidly following safe, perhaps, or they'll be confused about what they are allowed to do and what aren't allowed to do. And of course, that causes disengagement. So another, another of my favorite questions around the principles we want to adhere to when making this decision. I work in a collaborative workplace. So values that we adhere to in my workplace is to include others and iterate on our proposals and decisions before making them. Perhaps one of them uh, that you might consider at a team level is our, you know, the smallest unit of work 
allocation is a team. So we're never going to take one person out of the team and just allocate a project or initiative to that person. So those are some uh, things, those principles that you might want to adhere to in, in your decision making. The other one often missed in this list is how we'll measure success. So we've made a decision, but without defining what success looks like. So an uh, example I have is when a manager and director agreed they wanted to have a scrum master on their team as a test. They didn't believe in scrum masters, and this experiment was supposed to help them decide whether they wanted to move forward with a dedicated scrum master. What happened? Well, I assume you might be able to guess. No one defined what success looked like. And with naysayers, although the scrum master was amazing and brought a lot of improvements, the manager and director still weren't entirely bought in. The team was achieving their objectives regularly. Teamwork and morale had improved significantly. It's not an experiment without a hypothesis of outcomes. Right? The next thing I'll say is that we haven't touched on yet in these questions. You have to decide how you're going to decide. There are a lot of questions to be answered in decisions and who decides and how is crucial. So it may seem like this is overload, overhead, a lot of work, but imagine if you don't have these. When I ask people about the decision-making techniques they use, they often mention rapid, racy, et cetera, but those are just decision distribution frameworks. And usually they have a focus on one decider, which is quite different. And most workers work in teams today, right? Leading to a need for teaching and coaching various decision-making techniques and structured formats for team to come to good decision together. Even with a, if you had a racy and you have, or a rapid and you have a team in the accountable slash decide column, you still need a way to decide. Right, and uh, not to mention that racy charts are usually only brought out in the daylight when people want to hold someone accountable. Right, they're never referred to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, if you think about the example you conjured up before, was everyone clear on how you would even decide, and who you know who the decider is? Multiple people sometimes they feel like they they play this final decider role. Who can overturn the decision? If you if you haven't addressed this, what what it, can this do to trust if the decision is overturned? One time a team was told they had the decision-making power to hire a scrum master and the VP sign-off was only formal. Well, I probably don't have to tell you the whole, you know, the whole steal, uh, the whole deal, but obviously the VP didn't like the way this person answered one question and decided that they were not going to allow the hire to go forward. And of course, trust was lost. They hired a scrum master that seemed like it was second best to the team. And I will say the team moved on eventually, but the experience was not forgotten and no one trusted this VP. Right. There are other examples I'm sure you can come up with lack of clarity, um, to maybe two teams working together to resolve a bug, and the service that has the bug is owned by several teams, so if you have no clear ownership, what happens? Well, the, you know, when you come to a, a decision point where you have a few options and nobody was clear about the decision maker of who, who owns that global decision, right? So you can't make a decision at all, okay? So hopefully you're getting a little bit clear on decision boundaries. Let's move on to um, the patterns and reorient ourselves a bit. So we covered a little bit of boundary management. Uh, we're going to cover a whole group process. What whole group process is and how does it help with better decision making? The whole group process pattern says open approaches favor whole group process over closed door dialogue. To the maximum extent possible, the open approach favors getting the whole system in the room to validate assumptions, gauge overall group readiness, and obtain validated organization level alignments before proceeding. Why is whole group process important, right? It, we talked about including perspective, reducing bias, diversity of thought, no single person knows everything, even an expert, right? we have those blind spots, biases and traps. Uh, I have one example from my past, a startup that was growing, they could no longer do whole group decision-making. They did before, they, they went with consensus approach. So instead they went uh, all the way back and they said, well, we're just gonna pick one qualified specialist instead. So they, they did that because they felt like their organization was too big. When I shared why that might not be a great idea, then they realized they could intentionally pick a diverse but small enough group of the most appropriate people and specifically ask them to focus on both positive and negative scenarios, you know, like red teaming, what could go wrong with this, et cetera. And so they went ahead with that approach instead. In, the, in this example, if we're thinking about patterns, picking one person to decide without input is going to be an anti-pattern. So, so now that I'm orienting you to whole group process and decision-making, now you'll be able to say, oh, if I'm just one person deciding, then that, that's an anti-pattern. So the whole group doesn't need to be in the room for every micro decision, right? And I'll say in a team setting, a common shared understanding of what's going on is so key so that everybody has this um, context. And that's another um, open pattern that if we have time, I'll, I'll 
go through briefly. But when you put it all together, you can see this complex interplay of knowledge, decision-making and boundaries are so key. And I'll say the more global, foundational, directional a decision, the more you would want to make sure it's a good decision, if possible, as good as possible. And also you might wanna consider instead how to de-risk the decision. Right? Or uh, and as an example of de-risking a decision is making a huge reorg that impacts 400 people or starting small, reorging incrementally with impact from those um, impact, input from those impacted. Right? There are ways to involve 100 people quickly if you wanted to start somewhere. You could start with a survey, with a structured open table dialogue, et cetera. Right? Um, according to some studies, our brains actually function better when we're interacting with others and experiencing flow and togetherness. Again, again going back to our agile ways of working to promote uh, teamwork, collaboration, self-organization, et cetera. So that means the idea of whole group process is very, very important to us. And I'm going to interrupt a, a myself for a special brief message and say context is everything. In an emergency situation, we don't wanna spend time uh, gaining consensus or dot voting, right? We want someone to just take charge and decide. These are not the, the situations I'm talking about here. If you're familiar with Kinevin model, that will fall into the chaotic domain, for example. And here I'm referring to decisions that most agile teams are faced with, mostly in the, in the complex domain. I, what is whole group process not? So lots of misunderstandings. It's not a free for all. It's about great facilitation skills to elicit everyone's ideas and opinions. And frankly, this is hard, which is why there are so many meetings where no decisions are made. I work with a VP who hated group decisions. He said that it leads to design by committee, which always leads to poorer results. And I, I agree that's one possible outcome if you only compromise on things. So not everything has to be consensus, first of all. And second of all, I'm not talking about design by committee where the end result, a compromise is worse than picking one of the options group decisions with a poor idea of the end goal or a lack of good facilitation can sometimes lead to poor results. So let's say I'm compromising on a website design and making half of the website one person's look and half the design another person's look. That, that's you know absolutely the, not what we're talking about here. Um, it's also not about going along with what one person says, you know, the loudest, most tenured, most statured, et cetera, person's opinion. Simple tricks go a long way to improving decision-making processes. If there's one other takeaway from this session that I hope you get is that great facilitation skills are going to be crucial if you're the one helping a group move forward on a decision. I work with a team where they try to meet five times to decide how to assign code reviews to their team. I offer to facilitate a meeting and they said, no, thanks. We've already met five times. So like, we don't really need you to do this for us. Uh, but they called me up. I said, okay, well, if you change your mind, then you you know, feel free to just call, call me up and let me know. So uh, a few, they try to meet a few more times and they still couldn't decide. So they finally called me back and said they were ready to meet. And uh, the issue was very simple. They felt that auto assigning uh, code reviews by writing code to solve the problem wasn't really agile. And so they, uh, it was just a simple matter of getting them uh, like fist to five agreement. And then, uh, you know, we did some uh, thumb voting and they just moved ahead with an agreement to meet again in 30 days to try the approach and see what they wanted to modify. And it was just simple. In 45 minutes, we had an agreement to move forward with the decision, right? So I'll say, Often it's the simplest things that help to move a decision forward from stagnation to action. So how do we even do whole group process? You're like, Heidi, I'm, I have a team here, you know, so how do I even start? And I'll say, you can leverage existing team events and meetings, right? A retrospective is a whole group process event. You can use, if you want to set up a new event, there's a lean coffee type session, um, right? You can run surveys workshops, of course, and open space events, if you've heard of open space. Does anyone have any other events where you think you could leverage whole group process? Has anyone tried open space? Oh, what is open space? It's great. Um, open space is a way of I'll say it's called open space technology. If you if you Google it, that's probably the, the, the most uh, rapid thing, but but it's a way of hearing from everybody to move move forward on decisions rapidly. So you basically pr propose sessions and people join your session if they're interested in talking about it, and then you would exit with uh, you know some alignment and conversation on that particular topic. So yeah, the best thing I would do is um, go to 
Google Open Space Technology. There is, um, uh, let's see, what is the other website? I'm trying to think of. I'll post some uh, links here at the end of the talk. All right. Readingstructures.com for more information. Thank you for that. Yep. So uh, whole group process, how to decide. Okay, so we talked about how to do a whole group process and get the team in the room. Now, how do you decide? I wrote up a whole article on this topic and I'll, I'll cover the five option vote in the next slide. So we also have FISTA five, which is uh, similar to a five option vote, but has six options. So uh, you might start with a, a FIST being a blocker, for example, and then a five being a champion for the decision. Um, you can do thumb voting, which is, you know, yes, I agree, I, I don't care, and no, I disagree. Of course, you can have dot voting on the, on the results. You can use one, two, four, all. So, yeah, some liberating structures are also good for that. So feel free to post other things that you have uh, found being useful in decision making. Open space agility, that's, that's exactly, that's the website I was looking for. Thank you so much for posting that. That's most relevant for us. So for the five option vote, which is one I have been using more and more often because I find it very useful. And um, just to give you some history, I was doing a workshop with a large group and the teams had come up with a proposal to alter the way that their team works. But their proposal was in a bunch of sticky notes that I had to collate. So I decided to take the sticky notes and I wrote out the proposal in long form to make it more consumable. And I was trying to gauge a way where the teams could provide input and feedback asynchronously on their proposal and, and be able to give their um, opinion on the, the quality, right? So I developed this five option vote. And if you see here, you know, a one is like a, maybe a, you can think of it also as a, a five star rating, a one star. We vote no, we don't want to work this way. We don't want to go along with it you know, all along to a five, we like this a lot and we think this is the best possible decision. So this actually ended up working very, very successfully. And you can obviously do it synchronously or asynchronously on a Miro board. And I had them just slide the option over and give their feedback on the sticky notes of what they would change. So um, five options from blocking the decision to championing the decision has been working very, very well for me. So, if you think about the beginning, when I asked you how the decision-making process was in your workplace, what I'm hoping is that when you look at these options here now, these um, these five options, you might, and you decide, and you think to yourself, I could leverage some of these ways to reduce bias, or I could leverage some of these whole group process or decision-making techniques. I could leverage the uh, you know boundary management a little bit better. So hopefully I've, you know, if you feel like that's helped in any way, um, feel free to type it in the chat. What I really want to get you to start thinking about is how do we get, if you started at a, you know, a two or three, for example, how can we get above average clarity and quality in our decision-making process, right? How can we be more transparent about our decisions and how do we know when they're good decisions or not? Are we communicating uh, the boundaries and decision rights? I often hear that when people say, you know, hey, what is, um, what is Alan really like? What's Alan's job? What's Alan doing here? And it's not, it's less about Alan's day-to-day -day responsibility than the decisions that Alan is empowered to make. So I always act, I always bring that up in organizations and time after time it's resonating with people. So in the job descriptions, for example, they began to include the decision rights that that person has. So that's another thing to consider to improve your you know, clarity of decision boundaries. So let's take a moment to pause. Uh, I've been talking an awful lot and I'd like to hear from you whether you learned anything, whether you fell into any decision-making traps. Do you think you could use boundary management or whole group process? And um, what barriers are in your way to apply these concepts? Or perhaps you have a decision that you're trying to make that you'd like some input on. Yes, I do have a decision. Do we just speak up? Yeah. Hello, I'm Max Akessi here from Austin. There are there have been decisions in the past, especially, and I still struggle with it today, that when I get the group feedback, the feedback varies a lot according to people actually doing the work in the trenches and decision makers higher up in the hierarchy. This is always a struggle. And sometimes I have failed in some transformations because 
I stay very in tune with people doing the work and can change the way we deliver value faster and better, but then it it's not aligned with the decision makers and the direction that they want to go. How can you solve this for me, please? Great. <laughs> I'm so glad that you asked that question. So I would say uh, here's another technique is a technique that might work for you, but I it's again, it's on the um, I, this guy named Vivek wrote it and I altered it. And so it's on my LinkedIn profile and you'll find an article there uh, under my decision-making, but basically no one has clarified who makes the decision and why. So I, I guess I'd have to know more about why the disparity exists. D is the context there from a senior? Let's, let's imagine that the leadership team is making the best decision possible and the team doesn't have that context. Then I would say, well, there's a mismatch between the information that the leadership team has and the team has. So I would try to match to make sure that the team understands why the decision was made and why there's this mismatch. They could say, oh, yeah, I, I understand now. Or the possibility exists that the team might be making a better decision because they have context. And that's often what I find the case. The team has context. So they, they know a lot more technically that needs to go into the thing. And I'm like, oh, that, that won't work. So um, in this case, you could leverage something like this inverted delegation poker or just a conversation about what decisions the team owns, especially if you're experiencing this pain now, that might be a really good co conversation to have where, you know, I've noticed this, would you be willing to sit down and, and have a conversation about how we define the uh, boundaries of our decision making? Is it the team decides, that, you know, which technical aspects, for example, and, and how does that interplay with just making stuff up, obviously, right? There's an architect that makes the final decision, but the team should be informed. And so um, the this uh, delegation poker was first invented uh, by management is uh, th management 3.0, Jurgen Apollo. It was more, it, it was the, it was a very manager dictates, you know, way. So this guy named Vivek had inverted delegation poker. And then I, I changed it to the team um, perspective. Instead of I decide, I put the team decides, you know, the team, you know, we propose, we consult, et cetera. So maybe that will be useful for you. Okay. Thank you. I'll check it out. Cool. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, thanks. Uh, so please say more about five option voting when there's strong disagreement about several things that feel important to team members. Okay. So I'm just going to go back to this um, five option vote. So if um, there's strong disagreement about several things. So if the if there's strong disagreement about several things, let's say one person is voting uh, one, I'm voting no, and they want to block the decision, and everyone else uh, does imagine that they would be okay with going along with it, then I would find out, you know, why, what would, where could they move along the, the slider to like a three? What would have to be true for them to agree? And so it's very much a conversation at this point. And that's, you know, even though people, when I had this conversation, they were all three, four, five, you could imagine in other cases, I definitely had one person opposing. Uh, but when we asked them what, you know, how, what, what was their level of opposition? It wasn't actually a one. It was more of like a, a two. They didn't, they didn't much like it, but they wanted, they would decide to go along with if others want it. So have you, have you tried, um, Jeff? understanding the like the um, strength of their opposition are they really blocking it or perhaps they're they just didn't like it and they would go along if others felt best so so I've I've seen this in a couple situations over the last decade and uh, and, and they were they were uh, severe disagreements um, and they were in every case about things that really couldn't be known they were they were truly complex. You know, they were they were bets about how to proceed with something in the future that always involved le leaving behind something that you know was currently there, um, and 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 a, and a belief you know with with um, information that seemed unknowable that this investment, this moving forward, you know, taking this approach would actually result in a far better outcome. And they were just really, you know, there were different hypotheses, competing hypotheses and competing, probably could maybe even competing goals and certainly competing approaches into how to get there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I guess that, you know, you, you, thanks for saying they had competing goals. You know, I think that's the first, the first thing is perhaps aligning on the goals would be the most impactful. 
I did mention uh, in the early part of the presentation, perhaps there's no way of knowing until you explore. Would it be possible for these people to develop, to take two different paths? Let's say half of the team go and try something and half of the team try something else. I think it would very much depend on the decision that was that was to be made. Well, and, and, and that, that, that's, a, that's a terrific response. And, and that is in two of the situations, actually what we did, you know, that, that people who um, felt one way say, okay, well, you know, here are the resources, here's the time, here are the partners, here are the stakeholders, here are your competitors, you know, give it your best shot and we'll take three months. And then folks who feel like this other one is most important, uh, you know, is most uh, attractive, go ahead and, and, and pursue that. What, are, what resources do you need, et cetera. And then we'll compare and, and then move from this small bet to a bigger bet. And the interesting thing that in a couple of these situations that happened was that both, the, both approaches and even the goals shifted during that time because external things shifted that couldn't be known. And so either one all in would have been tough yeah. to recover from, but yeah. two small bets were mm -hmm. easier to recover from and actually easier to then come up with something even better to do in the future. Great, thank you so much for chiming in. That's, you know, that's part of what I found, uh, de-risking somehow, the de-risking the decision somehow. Why make a big bet? You know, is there something you could do to de-risk the decision? Thanks so much, Jeff. I, it's, I'm just looking at the time. We have about five minutes left. Any, um, any other questions or that folks want to chime into? Do you want me to go over the, um, the open leadership patterns quickly? I can talk about the rest of those quickly if you're interested. That'd be great. Yeah, I think it'd be great, Heidi. Okay. Sure. So you can go to openleadershipnetwork.com slash patterns. So we talked about two of them today, right? The other six are leadership invitation. So the concept of not uh, not imposing upon people, right? We're using open patterns, using an opt-in pull approach rather than a push-based approach to, to manifest and maintain enterprise level change. So open space technology, um, agile open space, um, and inviting leadership. Uh, you know, there's a thing called no limit self-management. So again, these are patterns and you can implement them via a lot of practices but it's pretty crucial to think about it as a invitation over imposition. Proceeding by explicit agreement. This is about organization of individuals being defined by the uh, expressed and implied agreements that those individuals enter into. So in the open patterns, we try to make those agreements explicit. Um, I, I think it was the founder of Morningstar that said that an organization is nothing more than a series of agreements by and between individuals. So this is what we're talking about here. So practices like, you know, sociocracy, um, Scrum has, it makes very, very explicit uh, uh, detailed agreements and agenda shift engagement. Um, thinking about clarity of authorization. If we think about the delegation of responsibility, including the clear delegation of the authority that's actually needed to deliver, uh, I could go talk about the time I was voluntold to do something and I didn't actually have the authority to do it. I was just, you know, I was just voluntold to lead this, th this initiative and nobody cared that I was that person. You know, I wasn't a VP, so they weren't listening to me. Um, Clarity of authorization does roll up several other patterns, like explicit agreement, leadership invitation, and clear delegation of authority. Um, when we think of interaction protocols, we want to clarify our communication and understanding through protocols, which are small shared agreements about how essential interactions are structured. Um, you can think of a check-in in the beginning of a meeting as a shared protocol. You might think of clean language as some protocols, uh, core protocols, nonviolent communication, empirical approach. Like yeah, organizations are like living systems more than machines. So acknowledging this reality. So if you think about agile practices and scrum Kanban, empirical coaching, uh, frequent iterations of experimentation and learning by doing, this is probably the most common, you know, that everyone's gonna, it's gonna resonate with everyone. Common knowledge in a team, common knowledge is up-to-date shared information that everybody knows. So when you think about it on a team perspective, if we're often in our little team silos working on individual tasks, we won't have common knowledge. This idea of the leadership team having different context 
than, uh, than the team. So think about common knowledge of how do I enable the, everyone to know at the same things, right? Um, that they can make rap, more rapid decisions that way. So um, things like open space um, and all these whole group process build common knowledge, of course. And so I'll say each of these patterns can be satisfied with any number of approaches and useful practices embody those fundamentally useful patterns um, that can enable great work and great group process. So if you get the patterns right, your practices will take care of themselves. Cool. So yep, again, feel free, uh, open leadership. Thank you, openleadershipnetwork.com slash patterns. You can learn more. There's some classes going on and I hope that you found it useful. Great. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I really hope you found this session useful. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, share feedback. I'm always curious to know if my approach and the, what I'm saying is resonating. So definitely wanna hear from you. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Heidi. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Great.